gospel was about the lost sheep and the lost coin. And we didn't hear the parable of the prodigal son. But both the parables that we heard were talking about the infinite value of uh, everybody and God's willingness to go to the greatest of the extremes to bring people back or to really hold on to them. And now the mood in the gospel shifts to this very confusing and, uh, and somewhat troubling parable. And uh, if you think it was, it's confusing to you, it's equally as confusing to me and everybody else who preaches about it because all the commentaries on this gospel say, well, it could mean this, it could mean that, it might be this, it might be that. So here we go. What Jesus basically is saying is that his disciples need to learn how to be as active and, in a sense, creative with sharing the good news and also with handling the wealth that they have as the unscrupulous who run the rest of the world seem to be. Because he's very well aware of how people were manipulating things all the time. You know, it goes on today as well. That people who really get into money or who are, have power because of it uh, continue to know how to, to do things to make more of it. Which isn't saying that we don't need money to live because obviously we do. But it's that they give themselves so totally to this process and allow themselves to be carried with it that that's all that matters and they can be very easily swayed to become unscrupulous, dishonest, to do whatever in order to, get, to protect what they have and get more besides. And we all have, I think, that temptation because we're never quite convinced that we have enough and so what do I need to do to have just a little bit more? What do I need to do to protect what I have? And all of those things are certainly legitimate concerns because we live in the world and you know, our creditors and other people don't really care whether we're Christians or not. What they care about is that their bills are getting paid and that we're doing what we're supposed to do. So that's why he, he focuses on this, on the manager and how this manager is willing in order to you know, pave his way into a better future, is willing to act in this continual unscrupulous way in order to impress the creditors as well as to hopefully let his master know that he really did try to set things right. Now, a steward at that time, our manager, was usually the one always in charge of everything because more often than not, the, the owners were absentees. And so they really were the people on site. And so that's what kind of gave him the opportunity to help himself to what he wanted to because the master was gone and wouldn't have known what was happening. Besides that, the manager had the right to take a certain percentage of the sales of his master uh, as part of his salary so that he was being compensated for his hard work. And similarly, um, he was able to live quite well uh, in the housing that would be provided for the manager. So when his crime 
is discovered. He realizes he's going to lose his home, his job, and the esteem of, of various people. And so that's how he comes up with this scheme and probably has decided that this discounting of what they owe is his letting go of his commission so that maybe his master will take him back. Well, it doesn't happen that way. But he does get praised for being so clever at uh, trying to make things uh, seem much better than they were and, uh, and that he had that ambition and that foresight and the self-interest of doing that. So Jesus says, you know, the children of light don't, you know, understand how to operate among their own kind. So learn from them. Learn what it means that if you really believe that what you have is true wealth, of what you have received in your faith is true wealth, what are you going to do with it? How are you going to handle it? Are you going to share it? Or are you going to hoard it? Are you going to think that it's a precious possession and that only a certain few people are allowed to have it? Or are you going to make it so that it can be shared? It's like with our own Christian faith. Do we support the efforts that are made to share the faith, supporting missionary efforts, uh, giving to organizations that not only preach the gospel, but also try to take care of the human person? Or are we always casting a suspicious eye on what these people do, and we want to keep our money here, and if I want to give it, I will, but otherwise, it's mine. One of the things that underlies the parable is that there's nothing, ultimately, that is yours or mine that doesn't have its origin and source in God. God is the giver. God is the ultimate giver of everything that we have and all that we are. And it's when we forget that and we scurry around and we, we try to protect and make more and, and do these things that it becomes a consuming passion, at least for some of us, that's when we have a tendency to go off the rails, when we stop noticing the people around us, when we stop seeing what's really important in life and just become consumed by work or by uh, managing what we have or what have you. And that's when trouble results. That's when we fail to notice when our kids are in need or our spouse really is, is hurting, but we can't see it because we're too occupied with other things. Or the people around us are in real need, but we can't see it, or we won't see it. That was one of the problems with the people in Jeremiah's time, that those who had money and power were so taken up with guaranteeing that they would have more of it that they forgot the reason why they were God's people in the first place. And that's why they end up through their leaders making all kinds of, of decisions that were completely against what the covenant had taught them, was completely against what they were they knew was the right thing to do. That's why God sent Jeremiah. That's why God sent the other prophets to try to shake them loose from this idea that they knew better than God what was good for them. But like in today's first reading, Jeremiah is deeply grieved, and God too, <coughs> because of what's going on. And God is not going to change his mind about the discipline that has to be invoked on them, that has to happen because of their infidelity. It grieves him, it breaks God's heart, if you will, to see what his people have chosen to do rather than choosing him. But yet, there they go, and they continue down that path. And all they end up doing is ridiculing everything Jeremiah has to say. 
And Jeremiah is looking at these people that he, he really loves, even though they drive him crazy too. And it's just seeing the whole thing because they're going their own way. They've, they've sought to have more and more at the expense of the poor and the needy. And so gradually it's all starting to come apart. Their enemies are on the horizon. They think that their alliances with the Egyptians and with uh, certain factions of the Assyrians would have protect them. Next thing you know, it's all over with. And they get dragged off into exile for 70 years. Well, you and I have choices to make every day. And one of the choices that we are invited to make at the beginning of every day is how am I going to live my life today and be faithful to the one who has called me and made me his own? How am I going to conduct myself today when I have to deal with people that maybe I don't really like very much? Or how am I going to deal with this financial concern of mine? Am I going to become obsessed about it to the point that that's going to be the only thing? Or when I, when I, if I'm still working, am I going to just continue to uh, get more and more into this? Is it going to possess me to the point that I can't see anything else, I can't feel anything else? Just this obsession, basically, what it becomes. And I, you know, and I'm, I'm talking to myself too because I become so concerned at times about our personal finances along with the parish finances that that seems to become uh, a, a central preoccupation and I miss everything else. And I have to be reminded, you know, that there's more to this than just this one thing. As important as it is, it isn't the only thing. That's why a gospel like today's, as challenging as it is and as confusing as it can be, is a reminder to us that the Lord's concern has always been the right use of wealth. The, because if it's used wrongly or it becomes possessive of us, it can take us far beyond where God wants us to be. And we can become much different kind of people than we are right now. Maybe we've been there before and have had to be allow ourselves to be drawn back or decided finally that this isn't the way I need to go because it's not taking me to any place that's life-giving. It's just becoming more and more draining. So, in the Eucharist, once again today, we have this great example of the second person of the Trinity, the love of God made flesh and visible for us in Jesus Christ our Lord, who emptied himself, the richest of the rich that ever has been, empties himself of his divinity and takes on our humanity so that he can speak to us, so that he can do for us what we couldn't do for ourselves, so that by his self-emptying, he could fill us with mercy, with forgiveness, with compassion, and ultimately with love, and with the promise of everlasting life, so that those things that we human beings could never do for ourselves, he was willing to do for us, giving it all, emptying himself to show once and for all that it's the things that last that ultimately matter. We all know that, but we don't always feel it. But yet that's what Jesus is self-giving that we proclaim and celebrate and participate in in the Eucharist is ultimately all about. So we do give thanks today for the love that comes to us, not because we earn it, but because God gives it. And let's ask him to help us to look seriously at how we 
live our life, how we regard money, how we regard our possessions, and how we regard other people, and see if we have things in the proper balance, and if we don't, to ask for the grace to do so.